You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Thursday, June 25th. That means it is first day of share 2020. And Yay. yes, it is also because it's June 25th. Uh, do you know what this day is, Sarah? It is the, I believe it's the 490th anniversary of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. If I got my date right from Sean Smith this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how, how good our math is. Uh, yes, uh, it is the, uh, the anniversary of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. What does that mean? Oh, what a fun Lutheran question. Um, excited to talk <laughs> about that with one of, one of our outstanding guests here. We're going to talk with Pastor Kirk Clayton from Zion in Mascuda about the Augsburg Confession in just a moment. Thanks to, thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin. Thanks for your support of the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. It is share and we are listener-supported. We love folks like Concordia University, Wisconsin, who, who've stepped forward to support the Coffee Hour. And we love uh, our listeners who step forward to support the Coffee Hour and so many other great programs here on KFUO. You can do that today. 1-800-730-2727. 1-800-730-2727. Pledge your support of KFUO today. Joining us by phone today, the Reverend Dr. Kirk Clayton. He's pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Mascuda, Illinois. Good morning, Pastor Clayton. Good morning. Great to be with you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us, and thanks for taking on this really just uh, um, (laughs) such exciting topic. Uh, uh, June 25th, what is, oh man, what was presented on June 25th? What is this Augsburg Confession? Well, first let me say, uh, Sarah, your math is exactly correct. Uh, This is the 490th anniversary of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. The Lutheran princes and theologians gathered in the city of Augsburg in Germany throughout the spring, May, April, May, and then into June of 1530. And they were called by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V to come and find ways that they could work together in various ways. Theologically was one of those ways. And so as the culmination of this time of discussion and study on um, June 25th, it was a Saturday that year in the year 1530, Saturday, June uh, 25th, 1530, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, a group of Lutheran princes and theologians stepped before Emperor Charles V and uh, a Lutheran theologian by the name of uh, Dr. Beyer and accompanied by uh, Dr. Brook, holding copies of the Augsburg Confession both in German and in Latin, uh, read the Augsburg Confession, read the, the German version, and then presented both to the emperor as a statement of what it is as Lutherans that we believe based on Scripture, um, and then also discussing things that had been changed over the previous decade or so in the churches that followed Luther's teaching that might be somewhat different from the practices in the Roman Catholic churches. So on uh, June 25th, 1530, um, we might consider this to, in, in some ways, be if not the most important event, the maybe the second most important date in the history of the specifically Lutheran Church. Uh, when you think of a date associated with Lutheran Church, you'd always think, obviously, of October 31st, 1517, Reformation Day. We had a big celebration of that about two and a half, three years ago. Um, and we remember that on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, and that's kind of traced to be the start of the Reformation. But frankly, the document that Luther nailed to the door that day, the 95 Theses, is not all that helpful of a doctrine, of a a document. Uh, There are many, many things in the 95 Theses that Luther posted in 1517 that would say, well, you know, he really didn't quite get that 
right in that point, as opposed to the Augsburg Confession, which comes 13 years later, is a very full, very mature and accurate statement of what it is that Luther came to be convinced of through clear scriptural teaching. And so uh, there would be no Lutheran churches today that would subscribe to the 95 Theses and say, you know, the 95 Theses is absolutely what we continue to believe and teach and confess today as opposed to the Augsburg Confession is and remains next to Scripture, um, subservient to Scripture, the uh, fundamental doctrine of what it is to be Lutheran. What is, what is it to be Lutheran? Well, it's what the Bible says. As we understand, it's explained through the Augsburg Confession uh, presented 490 years ago today in Augsburg, Germany. Was there controversy around this? Like, was there... Um... Was there any danger to these men who were presenting this document? Uh, what, what was that history leading up to this point about how Lutheranism at, at that time was taken uh, or understood by the people in these, in these uh, places? There absolutely was controversy and there absolutely was danger in making this confession and doing so very publicly. Uh, as you know, that uh, after Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door in 1517, there was a, a continuing uh, debate between scholars and theologians and politicians, electors, dukes, uh, princes who followed Luther and those who followed uh, the Pope and Roman Catholicism. And this uh, dialogue had uh, taken the shape of debates with Luther and uh, various Catholic scholars uh, and had not been resolved. There had also been the, the very unfortunate, unpleasant uh, occurrence of the Peasant War in between, where people had taken Luther's doctrine and pushed further than Luther would have to try to overthrow um, rulers, and that did not uh, go well. And so there had been academic uh, tension and debate. There had been physical bloodshed in the time between 1517 and 1530. So yes, there was tremendous tension. There was tremendous controversy and danger. Uh, so in terms of the, the physical danger, uh, Luther had been called to a previous diet, uh, which is a, a council, a, uh, a congress, of the German princes and the uh, the Holy Roman Emperor at uh, Worms that we're also familiar with in 1521. And there at Worms it was that Luther was told, recant all of your writings uh, or be declared a heretic. And it was at Worms in 1521 that Luther said, uh, or is reported to have said the, the famous words, uh, unless I'm convinced by uh, clear reason and scripture, um, I cannot and will not recant. Here I stand, so help me God, I can do no other. Um, and so that was 1521, and as a result of that, Luther was declared a heretic, and any imperial protection was removed from him, meaning that from that point on, from 1521 on, anyone who would uh, capture Luther or have Luther arrested uh, could have Luther killed and would have had the thanks of the most powerful men in the world, the Pope and the Emperor. And so from 1521 on, Luther's life was constantly under threat and in danger. Now, the good news for Luther, as a great gift from God, he happened to live in Saxony, and the Dukes of Saxony protected Luther. So, so long as Luther stayed in Saxony, he was pretty safe. He was fairly well protected because uh, Emperor Frederick the Wise first, and then um, after that, after he died, Emperor uh, John the Steadfast, or Elector John the Steadfast, I'm sorry, um, protected Luther and made sure that he was able to continue writing and teaching. However, if Luther would leave the region of Saxony, and go to an area that was governed by a prince or a duke that was not uh, in alignment with Luther's teaching, Luther could have and almost certainly would have been uh, arrested and probably executed. And when Emperor Charles V called this next conference, this next meeting, this next diet, uh, he set it for Augsburg 
in the uh, spring and summer of the year 1530. Augsburg is a city that is not in Saxony, and so Luther's life would not have been safe there. And so Luther, in fact, did not attend the Diet of Augsburg because he would have been arrested and quite probably executed had he actually gone to Augsburg. What he did is he got as close as he could remaining in Saxony. There is a magnificent castle called Coburg Castle that at that time was in Saxony. It's in Bavaria now, I believe, his borders have changed a little bit. Um, but he then stayed at the Coburg Castle uh, as close as he could get to Augsburg, but remaining on Saxon territory because there was tremendous danger for Luther to go into Augsburg. And so he remained uh, back at Coburg Castle in Saxon territory and was writing letters. There were about 70 letters that went back and forth from Luther uh, from the Coburg Castle to make suggestions on the documents that were being put together and to give encouragement or to give advice. But Luther himself was not present, as specifically, as you mentioned, Sarah, because of the tremendous danger to him. And the others that went were not entirely uh, promised safety either. In fact, uh, when the emperor first arrived, uh, he had demanded that the Lutheran princes join with him in certain very Roman Catholic worship practices. And the, um, the Lutheran princes... Uh, stood and refused to join in those practices and the emperor you know kind of shook his finger at them and said tomorrow you will join me in this and at one point uh, one of the Lutheran princes then kneeled down and uh, pulled back his robe to uh, show his neck and said um, no and you know uh, take your sword and strike off my head uh, rather than join in this practice, at which point the, the emperor in, I think, somewhat broken German said, no, dear prince, not strike head, not strike head, dear prince. Uh, but, you know, there, there was, the, uh, there was the, the threat and the understanding that the emperor did have the authority to execute those who he found to be, uh, you know, in challenge to his reign. Uh, he chose not to do that, but the threat was there. And so there certainly was a very real physical threat. And then the, the doctrinal division, of course, as you asked about Sarah, had maintained all the way from 1517. And this is actually one of the, the reasons why we have the document we do. The princes and theologians came to Augsburg with the idea that they would simply present a, a much shorter document um, about where they had differences with the Roman Catholic teaching and where they might be able to um, find a better understanding from Scripture. However, when they arrived in Augsburg, they found that one of the people who had debated Luther earlier on, uh, a Roman Catholic scholar named John Eck, had written a book in which he laid out uh, 404 charges against Luther, where he accused <laughs> Luther of every heresy under the sun, which Luther didn't teach. But there were, there were different Protestant divisions, and Eck simply painted Luther with a brush of all of them. And so if uh, Zwingli had made an error, he said, and Luther holds that error, he accused Luther of you know, denying such basic things as the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and so originally, the Lutherans had not planned to present a document that presented what they you know, agreed with in the universal church, but they actually found that necessary because they had to defend themselves against this, uh, this, these 404 charges of doctrinal heresy from, from John Eck. And so the Augsburg Confession then became not just an explanation of where they differed from Rome, but where they agreed in very, very important matters of doctrine. Uh, as opposed to other teachings that had sprung up. So it was, it was both, we don't agree with these other false teachings, but we do agree with the universal church on these central points. Now here's where we differ. So there was both physical danger and there was definitely theological controversy that went into the Augsburg Confession. You know you're, you're talking with a, a scholar of church history when one knows all the details, including 
the day of the week in which this occurred, such as a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much valuable history here that, that, that you're bringing up. And in, in just a moment, I want to talk about what does this history, this historical event and this 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 confession mean for us today if, if, if and to the listener if you enjoy and, and appreciate the the great history and things that, that we get to to share here on the coffee hour call and pledge your support today during share 1-800-730-2727 uh, and you can give at any level any gift is certainly appreciated if you give a gift Sarah what if they give a gift at let's say let's say $20 a month or $240, we'd like to send them a thank you. What is that thank you gift we'd love to send them this year? It's a super soft t-shirt. These are these are the t-shirts that uh, have, have become famous a little bit in our KFUO Lutheran world. Uh, super soft. They have our nice KFUO logo on the front and on the back. We have our Romans 10, 17 verse. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, which is what we do every day on KFUO. Uh, a bunch of us are wearing these today. They're the, the softest shirts you'll ever wear. And this year, they're in a nice uh, burgundy color, AKA the LSB red. It's not quite the same as your hymnal color, uh, but if you'd like to match your uh, <laughs> Lutheran service book and other Lutheran books on your shelf, uh, I would go with the burgundy one this year. Or there's also a teal, a nice uh, rich teal color. And uh, the lettering is all in gold on these this year. We went a little fancy. So, so you really gonna, will look like a, a, a past, <laughs> Pastor Clayton's getting one, too. I don't remember which color we're sending to Pastor Clayton. Which one did you request, Pastor Clayton? Well, I haven't uh, talked with my wife about the wardrobe selection yet. Uh -huh. but, uh, if you're going to match your hymnal or not is the question. That's the, the essential Lutheran library row on my shelf here, yes. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> we're talking, we're discussing the uh, the Augsburg Confession, particularly today is the anniversary of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. We have more to share about that with Pastor Clayton here on the Coffee Hour. It is share 1-800-730-2727, 1-800-730-2727. Uh, give us a call and make your gift today. <laughs> On this Thursday, June 25th, 2020, KFUO Radio celebrates with our day sponsors, the Schmidt family of St. Louis, Missouri. The Schmidts have made a gift to KFUO Radio in loving memory of Irv and Wilma Schmidt and in remembrance of their wedding anniversary, which was yesterday on June 24th. Once again, KFUO says thank you to the Schmidt family for helping us share the gospel and for being today's KFUO day sponsors. If you enjoy our talk programs, please call and support KFUO at 314-821-0850 or toll-free 1-800-730-2727. Welcome back to the share edition of the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. And we're both kind of geeking out over the great history that we're <laughs> lesson that we're having today with the Reverend Dr. It's Kirk true. Clayton. He's pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Muscoota, Illinois, and uh, just digging into the history of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession that happened, what did we say, 490 years ago? Is that right, Pastor Clayton? 490 years ago today. That's correct. So the, the Augsburg Confession, you've shared with us why... Oh, and you know what? Actually, What's that? Sorry to jump in. I just realized something else. The, the reading was at 3 p.m. I thought, oh, so we're not quite on the, the right time. But then I just realized... It is. ...time, which is like six hours ahead of us. It's like literally 490 years ago this minute <laughs> 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 that, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Bayer was reading out the German edition of the the formula or of the um, Augsburg Confession. So we are actually accurate to the minute. It took him about two hours to read it. Uh, so we're, we're within that window of the, the actually 490th anniversary. So happy anniversary, Augsburg Confession. Wow. <laughs> that is fantastic. I'm now, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. That was a great point. And we're that, a little speechless. I think that that may have increased our, our history nerdiness just a little more. Level up. 
<laughs> good, good stuff. So, so we've talked about this, this, this bold confession, and and who was presenting this? It's it's not just. Uh, this isn't specifically Luther himself. Now he's certainly um, providing some some direction, some guidance. But who are the? Go back again. Who are the people that are presenting this confession? The emperor summoned the electors, the princes, the dukes, the the political rulers of Germany to come together in Augsburg. One of the reasons he did that is he was in a, a bit of a bind himself politically. Uh, he was being attacked. His kingdom went so far as Austria and in Vienna. And at this time, Turkish forces were invading and were actually threatening to conquer the city of Vienna and were moving in through Austria. And so the emperor needed the support, the military support, of all of his princes to be able to defend his territory against attacks from the Turkish army. And so for this reason, he summoned the military uh, commanders, the political rulers, to gather for this conference to try to find ways to work together for military protection. And then he recognized that they would be more willing to help militarily if they were also in agreement theologically. And so that's where the theological discussion comes from. But the Augsburg Confession was actually primarily attended by the rulers, the princes, the dukes, the electors of Germany as they gathered for what we would today say to be kind of a, you know, a session of Congress. Um, and then because the theological issues were on the table to be discussed, then the theologians came along to help shape the document and so on. But that actually brings up a very interesting point, that the Reformation certainly was um, spearheaded by Luther and his determination to return to the centrality of the Word of God in all that was done and taught in the church. But Luther could not have undertaken this. Uh, well, with the grace of God, we'd never say never, but it's, it's much more unlikely that Luther's reforms would have succeeded if he had not had the absolute steadfast support of his elector, Frederick the Wise and the John the Steadfast, and the, the secular uh, and lay leadership around him. And so uh, Luther's work was in large part financed by not the church, but by his elector, Frederick the Wise, John the Steadfast. And so we recognize through history that there are those who work in the church as theologians, as pastors, uh, as leaders within the, the realm of the church, but they are supported by the, the generous help of the lay leaders around them. And so uh, Augsburg is a great example that Augsburg actually was more so the, uh, the confession publicly in standing up and saying this is our confession of the lay leadership of the church who gave everything, that they were willing to give everything in support of the truth of the doctrine that Luther had shown from Scripture. And so still today, there are those in the church that are pastors. There are those in the church that are theologians and, and uh, pastoral leaders, but um, need to have the support of the, the lay leadership of the church at large, as Luther did in his time with um, his electors and his princes. Uh, and so as KFUO is part of this vital ministry of sharing the truth of God's word and standing firmly on God's word and not being swayed by the misleading teachings around us, but being steadfast in the word. Uh, KFUO also, as that teaching voice of our church body, needs the support of the laity of our congregation. That's how it was at Augsburg, and it's how it always has been and continues to need to be. And so would just appeal to your listeners, if you appreciate, as did the princes who stood at Augsburg, if you appreciate the clear teaching of the Word of God based on Scripture, as Luther led the church to review that, then please, as the Lutheran leaders at Augsburg did, 
uh, stand in support with you might not be called on to you know, extend your neck and say, uh, you know, uh, chop off my head if needed, but to support in every way that you can to make sure that this proclamation of the gospel as is rooted directly in Scripture, um, as uh, returned to by Luther, that, so that can continue through the ministry of KFUO, this teaching uh, ministry, this opportunity to hear the gospel uh, around the world on your radio. So uh, Luther had the support of his prince at Augsburg, and so KFUO and pastors and teachers continue to need that support. So please follow in the footsteps of our our Lutheran lay fathers, the princes and the uh, political leaders at Augsburg, by continuing to support this proclamation of the gospel. So what does this uh, Augsburg Confession mean to us today? There's so much history, uh, and I have way more things that I need to go <laughs> research now because you brought all of these things up that I need to research. Uh, but what does this confession then mean to us today? Well, let me uh, simply follow in the footsteps of Dr. Beyer from reading the Augsburg Confession 490 years ago this minute and read Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession. The Article 4 talks about the doctrine of justification, that we are saved by grace through faith without works of the law. This article of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, has oftentimes been called the, the article on which the church stands and falls. If the church understands and follows in Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession, everything else kind of tends to fall in line. It's been described as the, the hub of of a wheel. There are other spokes that come out from that wheel. And I, I know um, you're big um, uh, bicycle fans. Now, <laughs> if a spoke gets bent, uh, you can probably keep going. But if the axle of that wheel uh, is damaged or falls off, you know, <laughs> you got a serious repair on your hands. And so Article 4 is that central article. And let me just read this. We have about two minutes, Pastor. It's short. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, it is also taught among us that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sin and righteousness before God by our own merits, works, or satisfactions, but that we receive forgiveness of sin and become righteous mm -hmm. before God by grace, for Christ's sake, through faith, when we believe that Christ suffered for us and that for his sake our sin is forgiven and righteousness and eternal life are given to us. For God will regard and reckon this faith as righteousness, as Paul says in Romans 3 and 4. And so here we have the absolute central teaching that God in his grace and mercy has sent Jesus Christ to die for us, not because of what we have done, but because of God's grace and God's love. And anything that we mix into that, if we say, well, yes, and we do this, or yes, we do that, we have then taken the glory away from God and called into question whether we are good enough. And so this is why Article 4 is and remains absolutely the central teaching of the Lutheran Church, that we're saved by grace through faith without works of the law. And that's why the Augsburg Confession continues to have significant impact and will so long as Christ allows his church to remain on earth. Amen. Amen. Oh, man. Go so read, good. <laughs> go read the Augsburg Confession. It's uh, it's in the Book of Concord. You can you can get that from Concordia Publishing House. Uh, you can you can find it online. There are various translations of it as well. Go read the Augsburg Confession today. What a great day to do that. June twenty fifth, right? Absolutely. The Reverend Dr. Kirk Clayton, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church, Mascouda, Illinois, and uh, man, great church history scholar. So Thank you so much, <laughs> Pastor, for sharing that with us and for being a part of Shareathon today as well. Thanks for the opportunity. It's always fun to be with you guys. Oh, good stuff. Mm -hmm. share 2020. Call and make your gift today so that we can continue to share this great church history and, and, and to dig into not just the history, but what does this mean? What is the theology um, that, that's being taught? Why is this theology important? If it was important 490 years ago, why is it still important today? Because it's all about Christ for you. 1-800-730-2727. 1-800-730-2727. Or if you're in St. Louis, 314-821-0850. There are other ways to give as well. Sarah, what are some of those other ways to give? You can go to kfuo.org slash share to give online if you'd prefer to do that. Or you can text the number 41444 uh, and text KFUO to the number 41444 if you would like to give via text message. That's just fun to say, 41444. 
There's so many fours. <laughs> <laughs> so you can get by text, and when you do that, you'll get a message back when you send that message, KFUO, to the number 41444. You'll get a message back on your phone, on your mobile device, and uh, it, it just walks you through that process. It's really fast, so super easy to do right there on your mobile device, mm-hmm. and uh, and, it, it, and it turns around pretty quickly. So 1-800-730-2727 is the number to call today if you'd like to make a gift by phone during share 2020. We have more of the extended version of Coffee Hour, um, mm-hmm. th- an actual hour today. I know. <laughs> <laughs> On KFUO Share a Thought.